Amen. Glad to have you here tonight. Take your Bibles, if you would, and uh, find Acts chapter 27 in your Bibles. Acts chapter 27. I want to mention that the Pullman family will be coming uh, this, this uh, Sunday, and uh, they'll be with us uh, both Sunday morning and Sunday night. I believe I'm going to have him preach for us Sunday night. And, uh, so, so Scott Pullman and his family will be coming. Uh, you remember them. They're from Parker Memorial. They uh, work out of the print ministry down there. They travel all over uh, peddling Bibles and uh, getting out the scriptures. And uh, so they'll be with us. To Acts chapter 27. And I couldn't stand... For the reading of God's Word, Acts chapter 27, and uh, starting in uh, verse 1 there, and this is what it says, and it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of, August, of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius uh, courteously entreated Paul, and gave him liber liberty to go into his friends uh, to refresh himself, unto his friends to refresh himself. And when he had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, uh, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia, in Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria, sailing into Italy, Italy, and he put us there in. That's all I'm going to read. I'm going to have you seated, and then I'll finish uh, reading the rest of the chapter. But let's pray, and then I'll have you be sitting and I'll get in the message. Father, we're grateful. And Lord, I pray that you bless us, give us a good time to word tonight, and speak to our hearts, Lord, and help us, uh, Lord, to understand some things that are going to, uh, to apply to us tonight, Lord. We're going to talk about cross-tacking. And, uh, Lord, that will be something that we'll learn that will help us in our Christian walk. And uh, so, Lord, help us to be attentive to your work. And uh, as the preacher will preach, we declare this tonight, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It says again in verse 6, And there the centurion found the ship of Alexander sailing into Italy, and he put us there in. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were we come over against uh, Nidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against uh, Salmon. And hardly passing it, uh, it came unto a, uh, uh, hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. Nigh where unto this uh, was, uh, was the city of Lacia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul amonished them. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt, or with her in much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to enter in, the more part advised to depart thence, also if by any means they might uh, attain uh, to Phoenix. And there to winter, which is in Haven of Crete, and lying toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, <coughs> excuse me, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, Lucy hence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocliton. And when the ship was caught and <coughs> excuse me, and could not bear up into the wind, we let her dry. And running under a certain island, which is called Tora, we, uh, we had much work to come by the boats, which meant, uh, which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our hands the tackling of the ship, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no uh, small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. It's like Paul saying, I told you so. You should have hearkened unto me, and not have loose from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be good of good cheer, 
For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Means they were sailing along, couldn't see, and uh, sensed that there was an island coming up or something, and uh, they dropped uh, uh, a sounding over the side, which means they dropped a, a heavy bucket on a cable, and uh, they bounced off the bottom, and it tells them how, how deep the water they're in. They did it once, they were in 20 fathoms. They did it the second time almost immediately, and were in 15 fathoms. That means it was getting shallow pretty quickly. So they need, knew they were coming up with some kind of landing. And it says, in, in, uh, uh, then fearing, it says in verse 29, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast from cast four acres off the stern and wished for the day. And as the, they tried to slow themselves down. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul sent the centurion unto the, the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, he cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat, then let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This is the fourteenth day, that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray to you, take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat, and we were in all uh, we were in all in the ship two hundred and three score and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast off the wheat into the sea. And when it was day they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands, and hoisted up the mainsail to the, uh, to the wind, and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forward part struck fast, and remained unremovable, or unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they which would could swim, should cast themselves first in the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Let's pray. Again, Lord Father, we're again uh, thankful. Uh, pray, Lord, that you bless the rest of this reading now. And uh, Lord, help us to be, uh, uh, um, um, Lord, just encouraged uh, in this time uh, tonight. And uh, Lord, this will help to deal with uh, some of our, our journey with you. And uh, so Lord, speak to our hearts again, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we just read Acts chapter 27. Now I've preached on this before, uh, but three things caught my eye uh, when I just recently read this. Uh, number one, this is the plight, of course, of Paul making his way to Rome. And what he was doing was he was, of course, to be used of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for a testimony of salvation, and uh, he was making his way to Rome uh, to, of course, testify and, of course, complete the trial that he had encountered or that had started in Jerusalem. And, uh, and so he was to be used as a testimony uh, for the Lord, and this was Paul's plight, uh, so to speak, um, getting, getting uh, to Rome uh, to be a testimony. Now, uh, you remember me preaching on plight, and our, our plight, of course, are those outside influences that can uh, impact our journey. Uh, you remember me preaching about that a couple weeks ago, where I preached about Zacharias and Elizabeth, and uh, the, the name of that title was, uh, they, were, they stayed right despite their plight, or right despite uh, their plight. 
and uh, they stayed right with God despite what was going on, the outside influences on them. And uh, Paul was another one who was the same way. And so that caught my eye that this is a lot of uh, <clears throat> the same kind of thing as far as outside influences can affect our, our walk with the Lord. And then something else caught my eye in this passage. Uh, look at verse 22. Verse 22 again. It says, And now I exhort you to be good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must uh, be brought before Caesar, and though God has given thee all them that shall with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I am with God, and it shall be even as it was told me. So, uh, Paul's course, uh, of course, was set for him. And, and yet, Paul encountered um, some trying times. And uh, um, turn me, well, don't turn there, but let me turn there real quick. Uh, Paul encountered many trying times uh, through his walk with the Lord and through his Christian journey. And uh, just let me remind you of those, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, Paul wrote this, and I won't read the whole chapter. But in 2 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 24, he says, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beat with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. This is one of those shipwrecks that he encountered in his walk with the Lord. And uh, it says, I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the brethren, in perils in the city, and in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, so you can see what his plight is. He's encountered many things uh, throughout his walk with the Lord. And then the third thing I noticed as I read this chapter is I couldn't help but note the attitude of Paul despite his plight. Now, I just read to you all the things that he went through, things that we can't even imagine. I mean, being being uh, beaten with rods, being, uh, being scourged and and uh, being stoned and, and uh, being shipwrecked in the, the ocean three different times. And uh, uh, it's just an unbelievable what Paul went through as he's following the Lord. And so I couldn't help but notice this, the attitude that Paul had despite his plight. Uh, the, despite the plight, of course, the outside influences that often threaten to alter his course. Uh, listen, look at his attitude. Uh, verse 25 again there in Acts. Chapter 27. He said, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. And so here's Paul encouraging, uh, he's the one that's going to this trial. He's the one that might have his, it ends up having his head lopped off after the Lord decides that he has given all his testimonies. And then Paul, from what the, the, uh, the story is, Paul ends up dying getting his head chopped off. And uh, so he went through all of that, uh, uh, following God, and yet he's of good cheer. Uh, look what it says again, verse 5, verse, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, uh, that it shall be even as it was told me. In verse 33 it says, uh, And while the day was coming, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that he had tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. He says, Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your help. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And so here's Paul encouraging them. Uh, this is his whole attitude. Uh, it, you couldn't help but notice this about Paul. This is his whole, his whole attitude, despite his plight, if, be, despite the outside influences, uh, Paul had a good attitude always. It seemed like he was encouraging to others always. Now tonight, what I want you to take note of is some of the counter tactics that took place in this little chapter in verse 27 that will help us in our, in our plight, or help us in our walk with the Lord as we face our plight, the outside influences, and all the things that can affect us as we follow the Lord. And uh, so we're going to look at that tonight, some counter tactics you know, that will keep you on the right course. And the first one I want to mention to you tonight is back there in verse 13. Look at verse 13 and read uh, verse 13 uh, uh, through 15. This is what it says. It says, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they have, uh, had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. 
But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Heraclite. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drop. Now, when I read this, I read this today, and I kind of explained this to Christine. I said, I want to show you something. I said, this is what's interesting about sailing uh, to me. My dad always, my dad always had boats, and uh, one thing that he always wanted was to have a sailboat. And of course, we lived inland quite a ways. We lived in Coleman, and, and a sailboat wasn't really feasible. You need to have a sailboat. Uh, to have a good sized sailboat, you need to live on the water. Uh, they have a big long keel on them. You could buy boats, I guess, that have a collapsible keel that comes back up into the boat. You can put it on a trailer or whatnot. But, but to have a really good sailboat, you almost need to live on the water. So we never did have a sailboat. Dad always wanted one. It always interested him. And uh, it kind of interests, interests me too. But uh, what we're going to look at this, uh, tonight is this, that as we follow the Lord, and we take examples from this, some spiritual examples, some spiritual application from an actual, in, uh, an actual account uh, of a ship sailing in the sea. And uh, what they were doing, when we look at that, the verses there in verse 13, what they were trying to do is cross tack. What do you mean by that? Well, look what it says. It says, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, Loosing hence, they sailed close by Creek. Now, have you ever thought about what it takes to sail? I mean, let me let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about. Say you say you have a, an island up uh, an island up here that you want to go to. Say this. Well, let's just do it this way. Let's do it like it's a, uh, it's Jesus Christ cross on that island. And say you're say you're down here in a ship. I don't know how to draw a ship at this angle, but say you're in a ship and uh, you want this ship to get to that island. And this is kind of like our our walk with the Lord. Uh, this is how we're, they're kind of think of it. And this ship has to get that, uh, that island. But say that your wind is coming from this direction. This is the direction that your wind's coming from. Now how in the world, if the wind's coming in this direction uh, like that, how in the world can you get this ship to that island? Well, they call it as cross tacking, which means a ship can sail actually towards the wind. But what it has to do is sail on an angle. Um, they, they'll, they'll strike up sail, and they'll tip those sails in a certain direction to catch that wind. And actually what it'll do is it, it, they can set their sails a certain way, and it can actually uh, go across wind like that. And so what you're doing is cross tacking across the wind. But I know what you're saying, but wait a minute, that's not going towards the island. I know that. So what you do is you have to, you have to do cross tacks. And then what you do is you turn that way and you come back this way. And what you're doing is all the while you're aiming yourself towards that island. Now you might say, well, that's kind of weird that you can't just turn the motor on and drive the boat right to the, uh, to the island. Well, that, they didn't have motors back then. This is back in the Bible times, two, 3,000 years ago. Um, they had ships. But they didn't have motors. And so what they had to do is use the wind uh, to get them to where they needed to go. And of course, you couldn't just pick a day uh, when the wind was blowing in the right direction. You had, I mean, they used it for commercial reasons and all that. And so no matter which way that wind was coming from, you could actually take that boat in any direction you wanted to go. But what you'd have to do is a lot of times what is called cross, uh, cross tacking, uh, where you have to do zigzag patterns. Uh, to go, especially if the wind's going in this direction, uh, you have to do crisscross patterns uh, to be able to get to where you want to go, especially if you're going to a place uh, that's headed toward the wind. And, and so that's what was happening here. Uh, what it says again in verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose... Uh, against it, a tempestuous wind called Uruclite. Now what happened is, of course, the winds became fierce, to the point where they couldn't cross tack. It got so bad, matter of fact, look what it says, verse 15, and when, when the ship was caught, it could not bear up into the wind. That means it, they couldn't cross tack uh, and, and, and go counter, uh, or counter that wind and keep cost tacking because that wind was blowing so hard, it was going to rip their sails down, it would flip their boat over. So what they ended up having to do is allow themselves to just be turned and taken in the direction whatever that wind was going to take them. 
And it says in verse 15, it says, when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Now, what are you getting at here? Well, what I'm saying is cross tacking is a tactic that all Christians need to learn in their walk uh, with the Lord. Um, uh, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Keep your worry out so you can come back. But turn to Philippians uh, chapter 3. Because just like I drew, uh, I drew a picture here, that our, we have the same kind of thing. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 3 and uh, uh, verse 14. Keep your worry out so we can come back to it. But in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, look what it says. It says, I press toward the mark. Did you know that when you get saved, that you have direction? That you have, that a course is, has been set for you. That when you get saved, it's not just like a free-for-all. It's not like you can just let yourself go. Now that I'm saved, I can just do whatever I want. I can go anywhere. No, no, that's not the way it is. When you get saved, look at what it says there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. It says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know what happens? When you get saved, um, there's a prize that you're aiming for. There's something that you're aiming for. See what I'm saying? It's not like you just get saved and you can just say, oh, well, I'm saved. You know, I can just do anything I want. No, that's not the way it is. Now, a lot of people live that way. A lot of people live like they, they can get, just get saved and never never have to think about anything and just you just do whatever you want. To do. You know, there's a lot of people out there that you really question whether they got saved because life has never changed for them. And everything you read in the Bible, what the Bible tells us is that when we get saved, we're a, we're a new creature. And we have, we have a new destination. And, and so look what it says. You might say, well, I, I guess I'm not quite understanding you. What, then what, you know, how come you didn't tell me this before? When I got saved, what am I, what am I headed towards then? How, you know, what am I doing with my ship? Where am I supposed to be sailing for? Well, look what Paul says. It says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? When you read that, what prize? What prize are you talking about? Well, look down a little bit farther. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. It says, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our body that it may be fashioned like unto the glorious body, according to the work, uh, working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Did you know, all throughout the Bible, especially Paul's writings, he's always talking about looking for that prize and looking for the coming Lord Jesus. So, so as we live our life as a Christian, what we're always trying to do, what Paul says, is that we're trying to become more like him. We learn about his will and his ways for our lives, and we try to uh, try to aim, uh, say we're a ship. We try to aim ourselves uh, to follow His ways, and we try to get ourselves on course uh, to meet that prize. Now, what was the prize? Look what it says. Again, it says uh, it says for our conversation is in heaven, uh, for whence also we look for the same. Now, I preach this all the time about the Lord coming back. Amen. And that Paul talked about many times that, that we are to live our lives in a way that we're always keeping our eye out for the prize. What's the prize? The prize, of course, is the Lord coming back and either rapturing us out of here or um, possibly we have to go to the grave. But in, in one way, shape, or form, Christ is going to come back and get us out of this world. We're going to be resurrected. Or we're going to be raptured out of here. Or caught up out of here. That's the prize. The prize is going to be that someday we're going to go get uh, get to go live with him, rule and reign with him. He's going to purge this earth, and, and someday this earth is going to become an eternal Eden, and we're going to come back and live on this this earth. I mean, what a prize! What do you think about it? And and so what I'm saying is, your Christian life, what you're going to find out. It's just like this, this story here in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 27, that your, your, 
your Christian walk, your Christian life is going to be very much like Paul trying to get to Rome. In other words, when you get saved, you probably realize that, you know what, this Christianity isn't as easy as you think it should be or would be. A lot of people think when they get saved, man, you know, everything's just going to be hunky-dory and I'll never ever have problems in my life again. No, I'm going to tell you what, when you get saved, a lot of times it gets worse because you have some, you have a new direction. And what's going to happen is what you're going to find out is this world is going to oppose that direction everywhere you go. And what you're going to have to learn is the principle of tacking. Now, let me ask you this. I know what people would say. Now, Pastor, isn't that kind of teaching that I can do wrong and as long as I keep turning myself in the right direction? No, I'm not saying you're purposely doing wrong. What would be wonderful is, what would be wonderful is, is when we start out on our Christian journey and say our starting point is here, it'd be wonderful if it was like this and no resistance. But let me ask you this. How many of you ever encountered that? Nobody. Everybody faces resistance. Everybody, how many of you have, how many of you have been perfect since you've gotten saved? And you've always been just right on the course following God and, and never have sinned, never have done anything wrong. No, that's not true. See, what happens is we encounter forces just like a, a ship that's headed towards uh, the prize or headed towards that island. It's the same thing for us. We encounter all kinds of resistance that is trying to get us uh, off our course. And what you have to learn to do is is when someone does get off course, they have to go to the cross tag. Oops, the cross is right over there. The Lord's right over there. This is the direction the Lord wants me to go. I'll turn back towards him. But what ends up happening is, of course, as you face resistance, there's a lot of times, it's not, it's not a straight line point A to point B getting to heaven. It's not a straight line point A to point B uh, getting, uh, uh, serving the Lord. You face all these fiery darts that the devil casts at you. And, and some of it's even of your own accord. Some of it's of, even of your own doing. And what you need to do is when you get off course and you realize that all of a sudden the Lord's over here and you're headed away from him, you cross tack and you keep heading towards him. That's the way it should be. That's the way it works. You see. And so when I got to thinking about that, I thought, man, cross tacking is a principle that we should really learn in our Christian life. That there's, and I'm not getting, now, now don't get me wrong, I'm not giving us an excuse to just turn away from God and then say, well, I can always turn back. No, I'm not saying that. God knows the difference. And so what I'm saying is, I'm trying to show you that, you know what, there are going to be times where you, 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 you're headed for the Lord, you're headed the way He wants you to go, but sometimes the, uh, the, the plight of this world can turn you and before you know it, you're off your course. And what I'm encouraging you to do is cross tack and get straightened back out and head back towards, just like what, what Paul says here, head back towards the prize. He says, I press toward the mark. Let me ask you this. You think Paul ever got off course? Yeah. He's human. Now, he's a great apostle. You know, probably one of the one of the, the, the greatest Christian men in the Bible. But you know what? There was times where where uh, I, I read stuff that Peter Reckman has wrote about how Paul didn't listen to the Lord, and it ended up, I forget what he said, about two years of his ministry. It messed up two years of his ministry because he did, there was times where he didn't listen to the Lord. And, and so it can happen to us too, you see. And so, what a blessing to realize that, you know what? We can always straighten up our course. We can always cross tap. And so what I'm challenging you is this. I hope you're not sitting here going, well, I don't care. I'll just let the wind blow me wherever I go. I'm saved. It doesn't really matter. Well, what I ask you this is, is did you know that Christ, uh, that Paul warns us many times, and I believe even Christ has said things about it, about will you be ready when Christ comes. That means where will you be? Well, what I'm hoping I'll be, and Lord willing, is that when Christ comes back, 
I've got myself cross-tacking and heading towards him. Not cross-tacking away from him, but I'm, I've got, you know, when he comes, that I've got myself headed towards the prize. You see. And so what an opportunity. Now, now I know you're saved. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I know what people say. Well, I'm saved. I understand that. You know, well, I'm saying, does it really matter? Yes, it does matter. I mean, it doesn't matter for your salvation, but it does matter when, when you got warnings in here all the time about, uh, uh, you know, about uh, receiving rewards and all that kind of stuff. Man, when the Lord comes back, I want to be found headed towards Him. Not blowing off my course. You see. And so, and so, I want to be found in the process of following Him. And I, if I have to cross tap to get away from those, those wicked forces that are coming at me, then I hope he finds me doing that. I want to be found cross tack, you see. And, and I never want to be, I never want to do what it says here in verse 15. Look what it says in verse 15, back there where we're at, where we're at, at chapter uh, 27. Look what verse 15 says. Now, here's the difference. I, I'm, I'm spiritualizing this. I'm spiritualizing an actual, uh, an actual sailing account of Paul on a ship. And, and what I'm saying is, here's something that we would never want to do in our Christian life. To where the forces start blowing against us and blowing us off our course of following the Lord Jesus Christ. For all of a sudden we say, you know what? I'm tired of resisting. And all of a sudden we say what they said here in verse 15. It says in verse 15, And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Now, as I said, this is an actual kind of a ship. And I believe there probably are times where the storms can get so bad blowing against the ship, a sailboat, that what they have to do is they have to just take all their sails down and they just have to say, you know what? we got to turn around and let the wind take us where it's going to take us. Because if we don't, that wind's going to either flip us over or tear our ship off. And we got to let it drive us. But what I'm saying is it, that's not the way it has to be in your Christian life. What I'm saying is you would never want to do that in your Christian life as where you say, you know what? I'm tired of the world's forces. I'm tired of people being against me as a Christian. I'm just going to turn away and let them take me where they want to take me. Would you want that? No. You wouldn't want to do that. You see. You would never want to let her drive. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. Amen. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. Amen. I just mean you would never want to let the forces of, of the world around you, your plight, to just turn you away from the Lord and just let, you, let them take you where you want to go as a Christian. Well, that's the first eight minutes. I've got a long time. Look at verse 21 in that same uh, Acts chapter 17. It says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sir, she should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. You know, Paul, that's Paul kind of saying, like I said earlier, I hate to tell you, I told you so, but I told you so. That's what Paul was saying. Now, as Christians, can I say this? We don't have the luxury of fair weather sailing. You're going to find out that when you get saved, everything you do is going to counter, go against this world. Everything. Everything you do. Every standard you have, everything this Bible tells you to do, this world is going to oppose it. Amen? Mm -hmm. Everything. And so what I'm saying is, you're not going to have fair weather. Ever. Not as a Christian. Not if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Not if you're following like you should. So when you get saved, you're going to immediately experience counter forces. And you just have to learn counter tactics. Cross tapping is the first. 
That means when it starts to blow you off course, you keep your eyes on the Lord, you keep your eyes on the prize, and you just keep correcting your course. And here's the second one. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 27. In verse 27, Acts chapter 17. Here's another tactic. It says, but when the, when the uh, 14th night was come, and we were driven up and down uh, in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed uh, that they drew near to some country. And then look at verse 33. It says, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat. Isn't that, a, isn't that a strange thing for Paul to do? But they had went for two weeks. It says 14 days. And this storm that, you know, and I don't, I don't know that these men were purposely fasting to, to call on the Lord. I think what was happening is they were so upset, the storm was so bad that you couldn't eat. But what finally Paul did is encourage them. Look at verse 33 again. It says, And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. So what's Paul doing here? Well, here's, here's another point that we need to learn as Christians. He's saying, Take some meat for your health. Now, this actual instance, as I said, Paul knew it was important for them to eat, you know, for their health. It was not only for their health, but, but uh, look at what it did for them. Look what it says. He says, Wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer. It did something for them. He encouraged them to eat, and them eating did something for them, and they were all of good cheer. You see. Now, how does that work spiritually?